Nice. <laughs> It's great because tonight the subject of the talk is letting go, but you've not let go of us yet, which is great. <laughs> Still really wonderful attendance. And uh, you see, we don't need to let go because the retreat's disappearing all on its own. Flying by. <laughs> So I'll just give a couple more people a chance to enter in. And while we are um, just starting, I had uh, an email from someone today who said that she hadn't been successful in submitting a question to us. And um, I wasn't quite sure about whether she knew how to use the chat box or, or what the problem was, but she thought she could use the chat box but still it wasn't submitted for some reason. So I just wanted to say that in case anybody else has been having trouble at all, we're certainly not ignoring you. I can guarantee that. We're trying our very, very best to cover as many questions as we can, as thoroughly as we can within a limited time frame. Um, and absolutely all your questions are respected, are taken seriously. We, it's just, you know, we're sometimes a little bit limited in terms of how far we can understand the depth of that question and obviously in terms of being able to have some dialogue with it. But I just wanted to ask if, I mean, you probably don't all have your videos on, but if there is somebody who hasn't been able to ask a question for some reason, maybe you haven't been able to use the chat box, could you perhaps indicate it? You could go to your participants box and uh, there's a sort of, uh, I've been told it's not a blue hand, but there's something you press to get a blue hand. <laughs> and then you can raise your hand if you've been having problems. And if we don't see any blue hands, then that's great. I'm checking on the videos as well. It looks like it's all good. Okay. So we will do our best. And also, if you manage to hang on until the very end of this retreat, we'll have probably a separate extra session with myself where we can have dialogue. It will be more interactive and there'll also be some little groups that you can join. But I shouldn't talk about endings yet because we're still in the heart of this retreat. So um, tonight's talk is a little bit more on the profound side about letting go, which is one of the most profound and perhaps hard to grasp concepts. Ha <laughs> ha, hard to grasp letting go. That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> um, and yet it's the whole thrust of the path. It's the whole movement and inclination of the path, the whole movement of the mind that gradually, step by step, takes us into these deep states. So the Buddha said, Vosagara mana paritva, labati samadhin, labati chitteka gata. And that means that if one makes the main object or the main inclination, the general thrust, the general sort of inclination of the mind, one of letting go, one of giving up, renouncing, um, giving things away, giving things up, the most important thing, then one easily um, stills the mind. I was going to say gains, but really it's about settling the mind and one's mind becomes um, Chitta ekagata, it means like one pointed. Sometimes Ajahn Brahm describes it as one peakedness because the word aga can be a peak. And if it's ekagata, it's like gone to oneness. So whether it's the mind in one point or the mind at one peak, it, it basically refers to the states of jhana and deep samadhi. So, what is this letting go and where does the Buddha talk about it? So the first most obvious place is in the Eightfold Noble Path, again, under the second factor of right attitude or intention. And uh, in there it's called renunciation, nekama. And this is what Ajahn Ram um, translates in his little um, catchphrase, make peace, be kind, be gentle. 
So these are the three right intentions. Make peace is the renunciation. Be kind is the non-ill will and be gentle is the non-harming of those three right intentions. So making peace suggests that we're not just throwing something out through aversion or through ill will or pushing something away, but we're actually following a different pathway in our mind, a pathway that leads away from suffering and inclines towards peace. And of course, that is, you know, moving towards peace means a gradual emptying out of the mind of all the burdens that weigh us down. You know, first we start with the past and the future. We clear the mind of those concerns. We throw them out, you know, we let them go. And peace deepens as a result. And then the second place is um, in the third noble truth. So the truth first noble truth for those who are not so familiar with Buddhism, the first noble truth is that the truth that there is suffering yeah, and suffering is an intrinsic part of life, really inseparable from life. And there's a cause of suffering and there's a way to end that cause. There's a way, there's a way to abandon the cause. That's the third noble truth. And the Buddha in that third noble truth talks about these four different ways of letting go. And the first one is chaga, which literally means giving um, or giving away, giving up. And I really love this one. It's one of my favorites in the actual practice because for me, giving carries a sense of warmth as well. It's not just um, chucking something out kind of carelessly or coldly. It actually has this quality of being able to hand something over. And sometimes when I meditate, you know, I start to watch the breath and if my mind is maybe a little tight or I notice there's a sense of self in there, I just say, okay, I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this meditation session. I'm even going to give this breath to the Buddha. This is my gift to the Buddha. I just sit here and I just give. And then the whole inclination is not about trying to attain something for myself. It's about giving for the sake of giving something away. Ajahn Liam said, uh, in his meditation, apparently, when he was um, had quite a breakthrough in his practice, he's a, another senior monk in the Thai forest tradition, um, who Ajahn Brahm respects quite a lot. And uh, he was meditating and he said, you know, you just meditate for the sake of meditating. That's all without wanting to get anything. And he had this experience where just that perception led to a very deep state of stillness and tranquility. He said it was as though everything became cool right there. It all cooled right down. And it must have been a very deep state because after that, he said the defilements didn't resurface. So I don't know if they never resurfaced or for how long they didn't resurface, but clearly there was a strong momentum of letting go and just giving, giving away, giving the practice over just for the sake of practice without any expectation of result so that's the key to real giving you give without expecting in return yeah and metta is a type of giving of course that's why i love metta practice too and then the second of those um noble of the third noble truth the second method is called patinisaga and this does mean more like throwing away abandoning um, it's Ajahn Brahm's simile of going up in a hot air balloon and finding that you're too weighted down by the basket and by the ballast in that balloon. And so to go higher, you ask yourself, what else can I throw out? What else can I give away? What else can I abandon? And sometimes when I'm practicing, I just ask the mind, what can I abandon? And I love doing this because it's not a thought that disturbs the mind. It's just a thought that sort of directs the mind to notice where it's still holding on and sometimes that abandoning can be as subtle as just the mind is too close to an experience that's unpleasant and it's kind of got stuck there you know and I say what can I abandon and it's like the hand just relaxes this hand of awareness or whatever it might be just goes ah and gives something more space so you can ask what can I abandon and tonight we might start the meditation by just reflecting on what we've already abandoned um, to notice that there is some, some letting go, some spaciousness there. We also have to abandon everything we've ever been taught or heard or kind of expect to happen in the meditation. And one nice thing during my, um, I might've told you this already, but uh, one nice thing during my three months rains retreat was that uh, I realized that 
expecting something to happen is one type of expectation, but sometimes expecting things not to happen is, is just the same because you're letting your past experience of whether you have or haven't had success um, condition what you may or may not experience now. And if you expect not to go deep, or if you expect that, you know, this meditation won't really work because it's only 10 minutes, or then you're actually kind of overlaying your own um, knowledge without any real knowledge over the present experience. It's like you're trying to second guess what's going to happen. And how on earth do you know? You don't know what causes you have in there. You don't know all the work you've done in the past. Not only this life, maybe previous lives too. And then the third type is called mutti. And that literally means freeing, freeing the mind. Yeah. And I don't want to use all the same words as Ajahn Brahm, but one way you can understand freedom is like freedom from being controlled and also the freedom not to control, not to control a process. So can we be so free that we're just able to be content? Can we be free not to want anything more? <laughs> you know, normally we think of freedom as, as getting more, you know, acquiring more, getting more happiness, but can we be so free that we're just okay with where we're at? You know, can we be free to be average? We don't have to be like the star meditator in the Zoom room. Can we just be okay to be the way we are? That's a real freedom. It's such a relief when you realize actually what I have, what I am already is, is more than good enough. And then the last one is analia. And that literally means like no resting place, no... Um, place for the defilements to take hold and um, a nice simile for that is like a bird that's like left its perch and it started to emigrate somewhere a long way off and the momentum of the flight takes that bird a long long way but after a while it gets tired and there's nowhere to land it's over the ocean it just cannot settle down and in the same way you know when we have um, less and less of a sense of self Things can arise in the mind, things can arise in our experience, but there isn't really anything for them to stick to. There's this lovely story in the suttas about um, one of the Buddha's chief disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, and um, he was renowned for his wisdom being on a par with the Buddha himself. So the Buddha referred to him as his son, basically. Um, great arahat in, in the time of the Buddha. And one day he was on arms round and there was this kind of demon or kind of some sort of invisible being decided to play with him. And he came up behind the Venerable Sariputta to test him out. And he came and he just went whack on his back and really gave him a massive thump. And Sariputta barely moved. I don't think he even turned his head. He just carried on walking full of grace and said, oh, what was that? That was it. There was no identification. There was no, my goodness, who could do that to me? Don't they know that I'm the senior disciple of the Buddha? None of that, you know, there was just this, like, there was no place for it to actually hit. It was just simply a feeling. It wasn't my feeling. It wasn't even an unpleasant feeling necessarily, or at least not one that could really take hold and cause suffering in his mind. And in a similar way, the, the less of a sense of self that there is, the less um, the karma of the past can stick. Yeah, the Buddha said that if we um, develop the Brahma Viharas, these states of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the mind becomes limitless, it becomes vast. And at that time, there's no... Um, um, oh, let me just actually find the quote because then I can make sure I get it exactly right. So he says that when the liberation of mind is developed in this way, that is through the four Brahma Viharas, no limiting karma remains there. None persists there. Just as a vigorous, vigorous trumpeter could make themselves heard without difficulty in the four quarters of the universe, so too when the liberation of mind by equanimity and the other Brahma Viharas is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there, none persists there. So it's almost like Mara can't find you, like 
things that have a root of um, craving and ill will can't really manifest in those states because the mind is so abundant and exalted and vast. There's another simile that likens this to um, putting a salt crystal in a big lake, in a huge lake. And this is a little bit like when unpleasant um, uh, effects from previous actions surface in a mind that is vast, you can't taste that salt. But if that salt would be put in a glass of water, especially a small glass of water, and that refers to a mind which is maybe quite brittle, quite edgy, maybe very angry or tired, then that salt is really noticeable. It's very, very strong. Yeah. So this is what it's like if one has done a lot of unwholesome actions, you know. Any other further wholesome action will just make the mind even more dirty and, and horrible. But if your mind is really, really clean and clear, then a few mistakes aren't going to have a huge impact in, in the same way. It's like all your wholesome qualities smother those unwholesome ones. A little bit like what Ajahn Brahm said with watering the flowers and not the weeds. So all of these uh, types of ways of letting go are, are really um, deepened and strengthened as we develop our understanding of non-self. Yeah. So they're based on the understanding of not-self, on understanding that we don't own this body and mind. And in the Anattalakana Sutta, in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said, you know, that if, if this uh, body, if feelings, if perceptions, consciousness and will, if they were ours, then we should be able to say, oh, let them be this way, let them not be that way. And they wouldn't lead to affliction. But because they are not ours, we can't say, oh, may I only experience pleasant sensations? May I not experience unpleasant sensations, right? May my body always be healthy? May my body not get sick? We can't say that because they're out of our control. And the more we realize that these phenomena, they go according to cause and effect, they go according to their own nature, not according to our wants, the less sense it makes to try to control them. It's like you're trying to control the wind, <laughs> you know, or there's like some kind of like the wind blowing all these leaves up into the air and you're trying to catch them. It's impossible. You know, they're going according to the force behind them. So the more we realize this, the less we control those things that are not possible to control. And instead, we can start to put our attention again in these areas of letting go and these areas of right intention, right ways of relating to experience, the places that we do have some ability to influence, yeah, and to cultivate. So we, again, it all comes back every time to knowing the path is a way of learning to relate wisely to experience rather than to try to accumulate certain types of experience, which we can never do. You know, we can spend our whole life trying to fix everything up in the outside world to be just the way we want it. And even if you're successful for a while, eventually you're going to have to let it go at the time of death, if not earlier, right? Even the most perfect relationships end in separation or in change. You know, they go through their different phases. And this is not to say that we shouldn't have relationships. We're relational beings, but nothing can be permanent or lasting. You know, no matter how beautiful, no matter how pure, I still have to let go of Ajahn Brahm one day, which is not a very nice thought. But, you know, was he ever mine? That's a great delusion. I say my teacher, but he's not my teacher. He's just going according to his conditions. For me, he's just become the Dhamma. That's how I relate to him. And yet still, as long as we kind of are not free from this sense of self, we do attach to people and things and we consider them ours. So the more we can start to contemplate, you know, that if these phenomena really did belong to us, then they would be here always for us. We'd have some kind of ability to control them, but we can see in our own experience how things arise and pass, arise and pass relentlessly, right? By day, by night, arising, passing. And, you know, for some of us perhaps who've practiced um, Vipassana in different traditions where you really focus on this, uh, phenomena arising and passing, which I did for many years, you really start to see that there's hardly even a pause between the two. It's just as soon as something arises, it's gone. 
it's it's lightning speed you know and that's not even the depth of impermanence as Ajahn Brahm said the depth of impermanence is when even that arising passing ceases <laughs> even the container the five candors within which you're observing things arise and pass even they disappear and that's the real anicca that's the real vanishing act so we let go little by little. I wanted to say that just to end because like anything in this path, it's a gradual training and we shouldn't just rush straight in. Um, and also that the, um, not the carrot exactly, but in a way, the allure of it is the happiness that you get in return. So Ajahn Chah famously said, if you let go a little, you'll get a little peace. If you get let go a lot, you'll get a lot of peace. And if you let go completely, you'll get complete peace. It's not really that you will get it, but there will be complete peace in the place of all this selfing and attaching and holding on to things that we simply don't control. Yeah. So we look for that peace. And, and this can be the guide in all of the practice. You know, as the Buddha said to Mahapajapati, God to me, the first bhikkhuni and his paternal, maternal aunt. He said that any Dhamma that leads towards peace, that leads towards disentanglement, towards fading, towards cessation and Nibbana, towards knowledge, towards enlightenment knowledge, you can know for sure that's the Dhamma and the Vinaya taught by the Buddha. So whatever you do, whichever way you incline your mind, see if you can just gently incline deeper and deeper towards peace. So... There's much more I could say as usual, but it's time for some meditation. So please settle yourselves and we'll try and do it a little bit more lightly guided tonight. So as usual, caring for your body. And when the body feels cared for, it feels able to relax. You're ending business with the body. As though tucking a child into bed. One of my friends uh, came to her first meditation retreat and she has three sons grown up now. And at the start of her meditation, she used to just treat her body the way she'd settle a child to sleep. She noticed from her children that if she didn't settle them properly, they'd wake up later and disturb her in the night. But if she settled them, she could go off and do other things. So take the time to care for your body, spreading that loving awareness through each and every limb. Knowing you can't control this physical body, but what you can always do is to care. You don't have so long together, so. See if you can care for it while it's with you.
I'm just inviting you to take a few moments to notice some of the things that you've already put down. Any of the concerns, the little tasks or duties that you did throughout the day. Visual impressions of the day. For most of us, the sun has set. So all those forms are subdued. Nothing more to do outside. Now you've entered this simple room in which you're sitting in, which is empty of the house, the street, the office. See if you can notice the freedom of that simplicity. The peace of having abandoned so much. And gently, slowly, noticing the mind coming into the center of time. Poised in the moment. Noticing the perception of now, empty of past and future. Noticing if there's anything you don't really need. Perhaps perceptions, thoughts from the past. Plans for the future. 
limiting self-beliefs. See how much you can abandon. As you move more and more closely into the center of time. Enjoying the peace and the silence. not controlling what arises. If thoughts arise, they're not me, not mine. They're just visitors coming by, arising due to conditions, passing away when those causes cease. And if the breath arises, <clears throat> this too is not mine. Just breath arising due to causes and slowly fading away. Each breath could be the last. One passes away. You don't know when the next will come. It's 
See if there can be a resting at the end of the out breath. Gradual deepening of release.
And as we're coming close to the end of the meditation, I'd like to invite you to just listen to the words that I'll say next. And just see if you can let go into the direction that those words are pointing to. In the direction of peace. 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 How do you feel now? How do you sense peace within yourself? Have you noticed there's a little more peace? Or maybe a lot more peace than when you began the meditation? If so, how did that happen? What did you give away? If you wish to gently come back to the feeling of the body sitting, locating yourself in time and space, noticing the hands on the knees or in the lap. The shins, the thighs, the bum on the floor, or maybe the feet on the ground if you're in a chair. You might wish to gently stretch your back, roll your shoulders. And perhaps loosen or stretch your neck.
sensing the space around you in your little room or large room. Feeling safe. With all the rest of the world outside, not your concern. Just inviting you back into this Zoom room, if you wish. And we'll have some questions and maybe some answers as well. So someone's asking that halfway through the meditation, after the awareness of breath disappears, I get a need to swallow saliva. It doesn't go away until I swallow and then I become aware of my breathing. How can I stop this? <laughs> yeah, that's quite a common uh, thing. And I think one of the difficulties in stopping it is that as soon as you feel that you need to stop it, you're actually making it into an issue. And because of that, it becomes more obvious. It becomes more predominant in your mind. So I would say, don't worry about it. It sometimes happens at a certain stage when you're not used to, um, to that phenomenon. And I don't know, for me, it used to happen, but now I don't really notice it anymore. I guess I just haven't made it into a problem. Um, and also if I need to swallow, I just swallow. It doesn't really matter. I mean, this is, the process of meditation is often one of deepening and then slightly withdrawing, deepening and slightly withdrawing. And over time, you'll just get more momentum in the direction of letting go so that these things will actually disturb you less and less. So I think the best way to deal with it is just to make peace with it. And if you need to swallow, swallow, because if you wait longer and longer, it'll just build up and become more and more of an issue in your mind. So I would say just nip it in the bud and try not to give it too much attention. Okay, I'm going to ask the question from the lady who didn't manage to get it in the chat box earlier today. So she says, I have a chronic debilitating pain and illness and can't sit and meditate. Ajahn Brown mentioned about meditating while lying down, but I get so relaxed that I actually go to sleep in five minutes. Can you actually get into deep meditation while lying down and how? Okay. So Ajahn Brown has done that. He has got into deep meditation when really, really sick. And my understanding of how that happened was a sort of um, a kind of letting go that was um, triggered by a sense of just giving up, you know, giving up the struggle, giving up the fight with this sick body, giving up the story of, oh, I'm so sick, I feel terrible, this is awful, when will this fever end? And at one point he just thought, he just realised the um, that he was creating more and more suffering for himself and something inside him just stopped, just let go and decided now is the only time I have. So it's a little bit different in his case because I guess he wasn't that sleepy at the time. But I think in your case where you're saying that you're lying down and you're getting so relaxed that you sleep within five minutes, it probably might mean that um, you could actually be lying down and relaxing much more. So what I would suggest if that's happening um, most of the time is to carry on lying down <laughs> because if your pain and sickness is really debilitating it could be that that initial rest that happens the first time you try to meditate there is very healing for the body and your body needs that rest so i would let it go to sleep but once you come back again maybe continue lying down and see what happens then because at some point the mind won't be tired anymore you'll be lying there for a while and the body will stay relaxed but your mind won't sleep all day, I'm quite sure of it. And at some point it will get into a different sort of energetic zone. And the nice thing is that when you come out of a sleepy state, sometimes the mind's already quite quiet. 
And if you can just stay with that quiet without falling into sleep again, sometimes if you can maintain your mindfulness with that, then the mindfulness just starts to build on its own because you're not letting any of the energy flow into doing. Yeah, you know, you're just staying really, really still with it. And I had an experience a couple of rains retreats back where I really did what Ajahn Brown said, <laughs> even though it was the middle of my retreat. And I thought by now I'm not going to get any tiredness. He said, no, really do nothing, really do absolutely nothing. And you'll probably go through tiredness. And I thought, come on, you know, it's week six or something. I'm not going to go. But I did because I really did nothing. Like I didn't even think about the breath. I didn't even think about progress. And I went through this really weird kind of sort of zone in my head. But after about three days, it just kind of centered itself. I don't know. The mind came sort of back into some more clarity and I carried on doing nothing and the energy just built and built and built. And I ended up having like a lot of energetic bliss just for day after day after day. And that was really interesting because I honestly didn't try. I just dared to go into that sleepy state for probably longer than I normally would. So I would suggest that because especially with the pain and the illness, I think it's probably quite um, healing to allow yourself to sleep um, and then perhaps just carry on. The only other thing I could really say is to try to find a different position, which is different from the one you normally sleep in at night. Sometimes that can be a trigger to the mind to not go to sleep, but I actually wouldn't fight it too much. I mean, I do think it'd be nice if Ajahn Brown could also say a few words on that. So I might ask him tomorrow. And then secondly, you've asked, is it possible to realize the ultimate truth without attaining jhanas? And I mean, I don't have experience of this, so I can't honestly say 100%, right? But my understanding is that it's not so much that you have to or you don't have to attain jhanas. It's more that if you're moving in the direction of letting go, these things will happen as a natural part of the path on the way to that full awakening. So I don't think it's something you even need to worry about. I think it's where confidence comes in. Sometimes we worry because we think, oh dear, if you need jhanas and I haven't got jhanas, I can't get enlightened. But that's not really what it means. What it means is that since you're on the path and you are on the path and you are staying on the path, you know, you're going to get there in the end. So sooner or later, you will have to pass through the jhanas and you will pass through the jhanas because you're on the path. So that's the way I'd rather see it. <laughs> and I really love this quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi where he said, there's only two things necessary for a full awakening. He said, to start walking on the path. And that's it, you know, once you start with right view, right intention, the rest of the factors just start to slowly build. And for some people, it might be that deep samadhi comes much later. It might be that you have to walk over the first factors or you, your path is such that you're going to get really strong in those first factors. And then you might have samadhi years and years and years into your practice, but it will be built on a very, very strong foundation. Yeah. Sila paribhavito samadhi, mahapala mahanisamsa. It means um, the samadhi that's built on sila is of great fruit and great benefit. <clears throat> so, I mean, just to tie that into one question that Ajahn Brahm touched on in the last session, somebody asked if nimittas are necessary to grow on the path. And I think it's a similar question because I sometimes wonder this, you know, you see some people and they seem to have this sort of natural propensity towards like lots and lots of strong experiences quite early on in the path. But in my experience, it's the people who have really cultivated each factor of the path very carefully and quite deeply that when that samadhi arises, it's, it's actually strong enough to cut through some of the defilements. And just these experiences on their own, without strong foundations, it's like building a, a really tall building too fast. It's very narrow, it's very thin, it gets up really high, but the winds come and woo, it falls down more easily too. So I think of it like build, build a pyramid, put all the things in place and spread them wide so that when you build that and you have fun building it right so it's not like oh I wish I was further on it's like build it really strong so you can be a really strong resource and uh, support for others and then bit by bit 
it'll be easier to put those other bricks on. In fact, it will happen on its own. So, but I think, yes, to realize uh, full enlightenment, one would go through the jhanas. And I think you would have to at least have um, some experience of deep samadhi, at least the first jhana. And the reason it doesn't really matter whether it's the first, second, third or fourth is because as long as the hindrances are really sufficiently overcome that you have the chance, you have this window where they're no longer operating and distorting wisdom, obscuring and distorting wisdom, you have an opportunity at that point to see into things like non-self. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing that has to be fully seen through, right? that you realize that everything that has the nature to arise has the nature to cease, everything, the mind and the body both. So that's the breakthrough at stream entry. So I hope that makes some sense. Okay, I'm getting lots of questions and some really deep ones too. So because of my experience earlier, I know that sometimes some people don't get their questions in so quickly. So I'm going to try and look for people who haven't asked before, haven't asked as much. Is there a difference in feeling letting go and feeling acceptance of whatever's arising? Um, a little bit of difference, but not a lot, I would say. I think that the first step to letting go is that we have to first of all, experience what's arising. And the second stage, it's like recognize, right? I mean, Ajahn Brown put it like recognize, familiarize, ease. But in this particular um, context, I would say first recognize, then my second rule of thumb is learn how to relate to it wisely. So second R there. So that would include acceptance. That would include making peace, being kind, being gentle all ways of letting go, but first of all, we're getting the relationship right so that we're not pushing it away. So that's included in the feeling of acceptance, but then some wisdom comes into it with the letting go and you realize that some things are actually um, not worth holding on to, and some things, like if it's kindness and if it's peace, that will continue. But if it's kind of accepting, say, anger or irritation, that acceptance, will eventually start to undermine the anger. So you won't be holding on to the anger. You shouldn't be holding on to the anger. It's not like, oh, I accept you anger, so just carry on. It's more like you're not adding fuel to the fire and bit by bit the, um, the fuel of that anger will, will disappear. So you should be noticing that the unwholesome things again are, are going away. So you are able to let go of them. So they don't just stay there indefinitely. So they start fading they start fading away. And the peace starts increasing, but it's a funny thing to talk about peace because it's not really a thing, it's more like an absence of suffering, but it has its own quality. So that's why I like that little meditation. I don't know if it worked to stick it in on the end, but Ajahn Brahm's done that for me personally a couple of times, just sitting with him personally, and he's just said these words to me, and I'm just like, <gasps> and I totally go into a state of like really beautiful peace. So it helps me to get like a, a tangible sense of that. I'm not sure if that was a very good answer, but <laughs> but uh, but you're on the right track. Yeah, you're on the right track. Ajahn Brahm sometimes says letting letting be is another word for letting go. But again, there are different stages. So it's letting be in the beginning, but then that starts to lead into things fading away. Things actually start disappearing. Uh -huh. When meditating, I see something like a high resolution black white noise. Sometimes there's a millisecond where the field freezes. It's a bit weird. What is this? Is there a name for it? And why? <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure about what you're experiencing because I haven't experienced that exact thing. But one of the things that happens at this point, like, one of the things I think you're describing is when perception just starts to get a bit freed up. So perceptions start being playful and your mind is becoming a little bit freer to kind of create and, and visualize and have sort of weird phenomena happening that wouldn't normally happen. 
So I think that's a sort of nimitta, but it's not necessarily a nimitta that can take you into samadhi because you're saying here it's only a millisecond. So it's kind of like you're moving from the field of the known to something a bit stranger. Ajahn Brahm sometimes says it's like perceptions getting wings. So they're just phenomena that happen and I wouldn't give them a lot of importance because unless it's something really, like if it's a nimitta that could take you into a jhana, then it would have to be very, very um, beautiful and very, very stable and really um, bright and alluring so that it would pull you in. You wouldn't really have much of a choice at that point, you'd just be pulled. And until that actually happens, I think the most important thing is just to, again, focus on making peace focus on focus not really focus right just be making peace allow these things to arise don't control them too much um and yeah and keep sort of orienting toward the breath if that is there not to force yourself back to the breath but just to keep on following the main practice and allowing that to strengthen and to build rather than getting too distracted by weird phenomena at too early a stage in the practice. Yeah. So I'm not really sure there's a name for it, but I think it's a kind of, it's almost like a pre nimitta nimitta or I like perception getting wings. I like that one. Okay, so somebody's asking, when the mind is not engaged in meditation, it's exhausting to be constantly countering, working out what it is and letting things go. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what you mean by countering and working out what it is and letting things go, but when it's not engaged in meditation, things go yeah really letting things go shouldn't be exhausting as such only trying to let go is exhausting trying to work things out is exhausting um there's actually not much need to try to work things out it's more like i say about just um gently reminding yourself to be peaceful kind um and let go of anything that's <laughs> that's causing suffering. So if you find that something's exhausting you, just stop doing it if you can. You know, take a different path. I mean, it could also be, because it's hard to say without a dialogue, but it could also be that in your meditation, you're getting quite peaceful. And after your meditation, compared to that, whatever the mind does is, is very clearly suffering, is very clearly agitation. And that is, to be honest, the nature of the mind. So sometimes when you have had a lot of peace in meditation, it's almost as though you notice that suffering more acutely. And you just realize that the things that before you thought were normal, the things that you thought were, you know, your normal habitual ways of being start to seem unhelpful. And initially there will be some suffering associated with that, but over time your mind will learn that and it will start to incline more to, to meditation and away from trying to work things out. So just noticing the exhaustion and trying to make peace, not even trying. <laughs> so hard, isn't it, to get rid of these I words, but just making peace, being okay with the exhaustion. One really beautiful word I like is to make an armistice with your mind, to make an armistice with whatever you experience. So you stop the ceasefire. You ceasefire, right? Is that, is that right? You stop, you stop the war, basically. <laughs> you make a ceasefire with your mind so it's like okay it's exhausting but that's okay I can be with this exhaustion it's okay exhaustion and then the exhaustion says oh thank you so much I can relax now <laughs> otherwise if you fight the exhaustion you'll be even tireder hmm Okay, so the other question is that if attachments will pass away, what's the point of starting out on things? I'm thinking this might be the self getting a bit agitated. Any advice on how to work with this? A kindness reminder would be welcome. So I've just given you a lot of kindness reminders. <laughs> 
Um, and I think that's true. I mean, the self does definitely get agitated when it hears these kind of teachings and it wants to assert itself and say, no, 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 I can't do that because who will I be without what I do? But at the, on the other hand, it's true that we start to think, well, what is the point of starting out on things? And I think that's not a bad thing to ask yourself because what it helps, what it's helped me to do is sort out the things that it's worth starting from the things that it's not worth starting. And there are some things that are worth starting, even though um, they're not going to last forever because they can bring a lot of good and benefit to people in the meantime. So, I mean, if I was sort of saying, well, I shouldn't be attached to anything. So what's the point ordaining and what's the point starting a monastery? Then that would deprive people in the future of potential benefits from that work. So the better approach is to say, well, it's impermanent, you know, I can only do so much, but I can put my um, energy into the process. I can focus on the actual process of starting the monastery, not on the results of it, but actually enjoy the process without attachment to results. So again, I'm putting my energy into how I'm doing it, how I'm establishing it, the qualities that I'm building up with it, and not so much into whether it works out or not. <clears throat> I really would love to read a small paragraph in here. Um, I'll still try and get to lots of questions, but I just found it incredibly moving. And maybe this is because it, it relates to my um, mission at this moment. But I just find this, I mean, it moved me to tears when I first read it. And this was when Ajahn Brahm had um, built the monastery in Perth after about, um, it would have been about seven years after starting to build the monastery. So it had been standing for seven. And then this massive bushfire came through. And he actually thought in that moment that there was no way the monastery could survive and the whole thing would be burnt down. And this was seven years of his work, right? And before that, at least 10 years in Thailand training for um, training with Ajahn Chah and, and sort of building up all his spiritual qualities to, to pursue this goal of spreading Dhamma to so many people. So where shall I read from? Yes, so Ajahn Ram said, at that moment, I knew the monastery was going to burn down. I knew it would be no more. But I also knew that the following morning, with the fire gone and only ashes left, I would return and start building it up again from scratch. So then in this little story, Ajahn Brahmali says, so how was Ajahn Brahm able to let go so utterly and completely in a matter of seconds? His explanation, his explanation is both surprising and interesting. So this is what Ajahn Brahm said. I was able to let go because I was not interested in results. The outcome was not the point. My main purpose was not to build a beautiful monastery. Instead, it was a good thing to do. I did it as an act of generosity, an act of compassion and kindness for the world. As soon as it had burned down, I would be able to continue practicing that kindness on the very next day by starting the rebuilding process. You see, the fire did not take anything away from me because everything I'd done I'd done for a very different purpose. It was to build up good spiritual qualities inside. Those qualities were still there and I would have the chance to continue building up the same good spiritual qualities on the following day. <laughs> I don't know, it just makes me so moved that somebody's entire orientation is just towards the spiritual path. The only thing that matters is the path you're on and the, the qualities that you're building. The rest of it is just like decoration on the outside in a sense. So our life starts to become more and more aligned to the path. And whatever we do, we do it for the purpose of deepening in the practice, deepening in kindness, generosity, compassion for the sake of others as well as ourselves. And that's how we can do things without too much attachment to one's own personal outcome, because it's not only for us, it's for others. <clears throat> okay. So in some talks, Ajahn Brown said that in Wat Papong, they meditated sometimes for the whole night. What's the benefit of it? And isn't it fighting against tiredness? 
Yes, it is fighting against tiredness. And um, Ajahn Brahm now says in retrospect that he would never do that. And he doesn't teach that, nor do they have all night sittings in his monastery. What they actually do in his monastery is not have any schedule except for the food, <laughs> which is optional. But of course, everybody always chooses to have it, <laughs> mostly. And, um, and Wednesday evening talks. And I think they usually have like either the Sutta class or a Vinaya class another night of the week. And that's it, pretty much. I mean, you have your duties because this is your contribution to the monastery. So they work maybe two hours a day, four days a week, which is really very little compared to any uh, nuns monastery where we have to grow things from scratch or most monks monasteries too. They, they actually have a very light schedule. And they have a lot of free time precisely because Ajahn Brahm thinks it's important that we meditate when we're in the mood to meditate and when the energy is there to meditate and not to start thinking of it as something else we have to do. Something else that's like a chore, that's like a marathon of some sort. Um, because then you can very easily develop a negative relationship with meditation. And yeah, he used to be nodding quite a bit in those uh, whole night sits other nights he was wide awake but a lot of the time he said it was just he was sleep deprived and so it didn't do much good at all and I've done it too like in uh, monasteries in England and in Thailand I was in um, um, Wat Pa uh, I can't believe I've forgotten Wat Pa Bantad which is Acha Mahabua's monastery and I was actually there for a long time six weeks which is more than many people and um we meditated the whole night, every night, and I did that. I, I used to lie down for maybe an hour or, or two, and then there'd be some sleepiness in the daytime, maybe two or three hours. Um, but my body was quite young, and, and it didn't really matter because I didn't have work to do. And there was a sort of energy in that monastery that everybody was doing that sort of thing. But in the long run, it does affect you, and I don't think it's particularly helpful Another senior monk in Burma once said to me that meditation schedules, especially where you're sitting sort of 18 hours a day, are meant for retreats. They're not meant as lifestyles. And I really took to that because by now I was actually quite sick from doing a lot of uh, sitting in Burma. And I thought, yeah, you know, there's something to that because we still have this body that needs certain comfort, needs certain amount of care. I used to sit for like 18 hours a day in Burma for years, right? And for long sessions as well. And at first it didn't seem to matter, especially when I was inside my meditation, the body wouldn't really, you know, cause any concern. But afterwards, it would kind of have its reactions. And I was actually getting sicker and sicker over several years. So now I think it's much better to have a schedule and have a relationship with your body, which is sustainable in the longer run. But yes, for some people, it's something they may like to do or just like sort of try once in a while, see how they go. Okay. Mm. Is it correct to say that I don't own five aggregates, surely because they're out of my control, but even more because me, the owner, is just a delusion? Is that why I don't have control? Mm. Yes, both, I would say. I mean, it's both. The aggregates are just doing their thing according to causes and conditions. I mean, they do have some kind of orderliness in the sense that they will um, continue due to the conditions that have already been put in place. Um, so, you know, there's not really much we can do about it now, except how to relate to that process with more kindness and wisdom. But yes, of course, the owner is just a delusion. Um, so we think we make choices. We think we have some kind of control, like we can decide to go jogging or we can decide to eat a healthy meal. But even that is conditioned. I might, I might only go jogging because, you know, somebody's told me it's a good thing to do or maybe I had benefit from it before and maybe I eat a certain kind of meal because I've read about it but if I hadn't read about it I wouldn't even know it was a choice so even though it seems we have a choice our options are very limited by our um, upbringing by the things we've heard the people we've come in contact with we only see this many of the choices that are actually available to us 
Mm -hmm. So we tend, and we also tend to go down the same routes again and again, just because we're like our minds and our brains even get conditioned to, to following certain pathways. And of course, even deeper than that, there are experiments now that show that um, when we think we make a decision, um, there was already activity in the brain before we were aware that we decided to do something. There was already an activity happening in the brain that was predisposing us to that particular action before we knew we were going to do it. So this has been proven in some psychological studies, which is quite fascinating. So it's almost as if like signals are going off that we don't even know about. And then we think, oh, I decided to do it. But that's that understanding that I'm I'm making a volition to do something comes in afterwards. So that's kind of really freaky, isn't it? That's kind of scary. <laughs> and I can't pretend to like really get that, you know, really understand that. But what I can know is that the more I butt out and the, the more I um, stop wasting energy on control, the more happiness starts to arise, especially obviously if I'm conditioning my mind with the Dhamma. So this is why the Buddha says, you know, that the number one uh, first most important thing on the path is spiritual friendship, wise companions, because they, in a sense, put in a different program in your mind. Otherwise, we'd be just operating on the ones we were we inherited from birth and from school and family and friends. So we have to have a different one, <laughs> the one authorized by the Buddha. So the Buddha's teachings and the teachings of those who trod this path before us and who've you know gone further on the path than we have to give us some different ideas like just let go a little bit more and then you sort of think what does that mean because that's not in my repertoire but after a while you get some hints and some tips like let be make peace what does that really mean okay peace 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 and then you just get some kind of sense of it and it's really trial and error at first but you start to notice if you're getting it right, you're going to be moving towards more peace and more bliss. And you're going to have more energy freed up as well. Because you're not wasting it on things you can't control. So I hope that helps a little bit. Oh, there's not heaps and heaps of questions today. Okay. Many times when I start to meditate, I don't find real silence. There's an ongoing noise like a a buzz as one under high voltage electricity pylons just between my ears so incessant inside my head when it's there I start to observe it can you tell me if it's caused by stress um I doubt that it's caused by stress unless it's something like tinnitus is that caused by stress I'm not sure um, this is commonly referred to in some traditions as the sound of silence. I mean, Ajahn Sumedho makes a big thing of that and actually sort of focuses on that as a meditation object. But the Buddha never spoke about that as a meditation object. And I think the issue for me with that would be that um, it's not a natural phenomena that's arising in the body. So I don't see how so much insight can arise with that particular meditation object. And um, I mean, that's just one reason. The fact that it's not in the suttas to me is another <laughs> more important reason. Um, so I would say try not to give it too much importance. I mean, I've been on retreats. I get that a lot, actually. I can hear that really loudly. So I don't think that it's something like a deep stage of meditation because I can hear that loudly even when my mind's talking or when I'm not that still. Um, but sometimes I've been on retreats, like in India once, it was a 45 day and I was in this little cell for like the whole time you meditate for about 12, 14 hours in there. And it was so loud. It was like, it was thunderously loud, just woo, the whole time. And um, I guess I knew at that time just not to give it much importance and to instead like just carry on with the practice, which was observing whatever arose without judgment, without choosing. Um, and mainly focus on, on the fact that everything was arising and passing. So that was the object at that time. So in a similar way, I'd say, you know, try not to give it too much importance and just um, incline your mind to whatever's being taught here. So if, you know, the, um, the breath meditation is something that works for you, just make the breath in the center of your mental screen. You know, the silence sound, that kind of 
high frequency pitch can still be there, but just let it be there on the edge. Don't give it really too much importance because this is not um, something that you need to follow. So don't worry about it one way or the other. Yeah. For me, I just sometimes realize after a while that it wasn't there, but I actually don't even ask anymore, was it there or not? So I think after a while, when you just don't give things importance, they tend not to, to matter so much. Okay. So most of these questions are from people who've asked a few already, but that's fine because, okay. Sometimes when I pay attention to my breathing, I try and control it and it becomes uncomfortable. Can you give any tips on how to stay with the breath in its natural rhythm? Yeah, I mean, it's just a tendency of the mind that whatever we're aware of, we do control and it happens very subtly. Like I don't know much about quantum physics, but apparently in quantum physics, anything that you're aware of, you just knowing it um, is enough to start controlling it. So it's a subtle level that's happening all the time. So it's more, I mean, you might have always been doing that and just not really realized it before. So I would say just, it takes some time to learn not to do it. It may be arising because of fear. You may be thinking that if you don't control it, then, you know, it'll disappear. But the more we learn to just sort of put the causes in place and not even go after the breath, the less we tend to control it. Like I said about my experience in Perth a while ago, I really didn't choose an object, you know, for days and days and went through all this sort of sleepiness. And, and eventually when the breathing came, which it did, um, it was so beautiful and so light and, and joyful straight away. And I thought, my goodness, how come it's not always this easy? It really is that easy to get into silence and bliss with the breath. But of course, at other times I forget that and I start to sort of have a bit of doing or, you know, I didn't come at it quite gently or quietly enough. So it's an experiment, but I would say, yeah, possibly stay with the preliminaries of the meditation for a bit longer, making peace, being kind. And then when the breath comes, yeah, you'll notice a bit of control in the beginning, but just be patient with that. And over time, it'll settle down. So don't worry too much about that. Again, if you sort of notice it and start to be over concerned with it, then you'll make it into an issue. Whereas actually over time it will settle down. I mean, sometimes if you're ready for it, long sitting is really good. I mean, not sitting like a aditan and saying, I must sit for an hour, I must sit for two hours. But if it ever happens naturally, you'll find that things do just settle down over a period of time, which is one of the reasons I sit for a long time because my mind takes quite a while to settle down. Uh, so that's something else that could help in the longer run. Um, okay. So someone's asking, after the fruition of stream entry, what is the process of that? So this is a very deep question because obviously if one hasn't attained stream entry and is not on that path towards becoming an arahat, it's only speculation to a degree. But my understanding is that with stream entry, one has perfected their view. So they know there's no self, they know that things cease, they know that you know there's no doubt anymore about the path. And it's very much an automatic process from there. So what tends to happen, I, this is what I've understood from talking to people I have confidence in as having experienced this. What tends to happen is that um, the view is perfect. You know there's nobody in there. But sometimes the thoughts and perceptions still think in terms of a self because they've not been fully purified by view just yet. So we still have some old conditioning. But then they remember very quickly, oh, yeah, you know, actually there's no self. And actually that's there all the time. They can never be made to believe there's a self. So that just keeps happening and the thoughts and perceptions come more and more into alignment with view so that the further you go, the less you can even conceive in terms of a self. Um, and then increasing fetters fall away. So in the beginning as a stream enterer, the craving, the desire and ill will haven't really been um, 
um, they're still there. I mean, they're less likely to last as long because they're not being fueled by like, this is my anger, this is my desire, but they're still there. So with the next factors of the path, they start to be worn away. <clears throat> and by the time you reach the third stage of enlightenment, there's no more craving, there's no more desire, lost sexuality at all, or any ill will. Nothing can make you angry, nothing, right? You just don't have the roots of anger and, and desire anymore. But still there's a slight sort of sense that, okay, there's no self, but there's still this very subtle, what they call a conceit, that I'm better, equal or worse, which is quite interesting because even the conceit I'm equal is still conceiving in terms of a self. It's still conceiving in terms of being something that can measure itself against something else. So it's not that ego is only thinking you're great, it's thinking you're anything at all, right? Um, and so it's only with full enlightenment that that completely goes away because the thought, perception and view are completely in alignment and you can't even think in terms of a self, even in the subtlest way. And also there's no restlessness anymore. So in the third stage of enlightenment, there's no ill will and lust, but there's still a bit of restlessness and a little bit of conceit in, in those ways, of, in terms of I am something, sort of. <laughs> so that's my um, worldly understanding. That's not my, you know, enlightened non-understanding. But uh, this is how I understand it. Um, feel free to ask Ajahn Brahm. But he would definitely say that, you know, there's nothing you actually have to do at that point. It's such a natural process. I mean, even for us, you know, before enlightenment, he's saying don't do very much, right? He has that much trust in the Dhamma. So by the time you're at stream entry, I mean, you've already got the eightfold path kind of packed. It's just a matter of refining and purifying the thought and perception to come in alignment and uh, weakening those fetters, those last fetters. So, yeah. So it happens and, and you know, the beauty of it is, this is why I think people underestimate the depth and power and importance of stream entry. Once you're a stream entry, there's no way you will not become fully enlightened. There's absolutely no way. It's like the course is set. You undermine the delusion of a self. You, you don't see things, you know, you basically have no self view anymore. And that's what it means about the bird has no landing place. The bird sets off and it has nowhere to roost. Nothing can stick anymore. You're just basically, Ajahn Ram calls it like a workman waiting for their wages. So I don't know, I find it all amazingly inspiring. <laughs> and uh, it's just incredible to know that there are noble beings in this world, you know, who have made an end or who are well, well, well on the way to it. <clears throat> and that we all are on the way. To become, you know, to making the noble path manifest within ourselves, as long as, like Bhikkhu Bodhi said, we walk on the path and we continue. And it's very important to know that you're, you know, how to walk on that path. And that's why, again, to keep taking guidance from people who've gone that way before, or at least understand the suttas really, really well um, through their experience to some degree as well. This is really important because there are many kind of byways and detours and dead ends that you can go down if if you don't have good guidance so but again keep coming back to making peace being kind being gentle and you'll be okay okay i thought i'd finished everything but i've just seen one more oh just seen one more so i'll just say this one more if you can if you've got another two, three minutes, is everyone good? Yep. Okay. Where is the line between contentment in current circumstances and the necessity to change them? When is it beneficial to change our attitude to a situation and when to leave the situation? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Contentment doesn't mean being complacent. It doesn't mean a, a kind of apathy or feeling or being disempowered. That's not what it means. I think it's, it can be a dangerous teaching if it's taken to extend to every situation in our daily life. I would normally talk about contentment much more in relation to the practice itself and to what we do in our mind. And in situations that we really can't change, 
But if you find that an external situation is really um, unconducive for you, especially if it's something abusive, obviously, um, or even something that's just not that conducive for you to practice the Dhamma, then as far as possible, I would say, try to change that situation. Um, the Buddha actually said for monastics, the standard was that if the wholesome qualities are not increasing and the wholesome, unwholesome ones are increasing, to leave that place, even if you're getting supported in that place as a monastic, even if you like the teacher, if you find that the wholesome qualities are not uh, are reducing, you know, not increasing, to go away from that place. So, I mean, I've been in situations where I felt very unsure that it was conducive for me. And I didn't leave just like that in, within a day, which is actually what it says in the suttas. I left it quite a while and I checked it month by month, you know, is this really the case? And I also experimented with being in different places. So, you know, I went, say, to a retreat center and, and checked, am I still feeling this sense of like despair or doubt when I'm there as well? Or is it due to the circumstance? And after a while, it became very clear to me that it was due to the context. And in a different context, I was more likely to thrive. So I took some chances, you know, I took chances and sacrificed things without knowing for sure that I'd have anywhere to land, so to speak. But it was worth it to me because if my practice and my meditation, my state of mind is not thriving, then I'm willing to make sacrifices at the material level. So it's up to each person to know for themselves. And we, we're not always in a privileged enough position to do that, to make that change. So do um, check carefully, don't make rash decisions, but um, certainly, you know, first of all, check how you're relating to the situation and see if there's anything you can change by improving your attitude, bringing more kindness, more um, sometimes, sometimes boundaries, you know, sometimes kindness appears in the form of a boundary or even appears in the, in the form of um, being quite firm and quite strong to protect yourself or to ask somebody, you know, what you need and to say that this behavior that I'm, I'm experiencing or this way that I'm being treated is, is having this effect on me and you know, and, and to tell them, but try to use um, nonviolent communication as far as you can. Um, so try, see how far you can go by changing your attitude. But if that's not enough, then you might need to change the situation too. So there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. The Buddha definitely said it's important to have a, a conducive situation. It was the first um, blessing in the Mangala Sutta is... Um, Patirupa de Savasa Cha, um, to have suitable conditions, a suitable place to stay. And then further on in there is um, to have wise friends, spiritual friends. And, and the Buddha said, if you have a companion who, you should have a companion who is equal or better to you. I always thought that was strange because the one who's better to you means that their companion is someone who's not equal because <laughs> <laughs> they're better than you. So they have someone who's not better but I think that means in the case of someone who's an enlightened teacher you know so you choose someone who's at least equal in terms of their spiritual understanding if you can or in terms of their virtue you know you may be different they may have strengths that you don't have and vice versa but you're somehow complementary and equal so you're not having to like less lower yourself lower your own standards of conduct um, to meet them halfway because this will pull you down and he said that if you can't find a companion who's better than equal then it's better to wander like a lonely horn of a rhinoceros a single horn wander alone like the rhinoceros horn so sometimes we have to let go of relationships so whatever but to do so kindly and to do so knowing that you're doing that to, to further yourself on the path Okay, so it's after nine. It seems that there are more messages that are coming in, more questions, but uh, <laughs> okay. Somebody's just asked a question that's supposed to be private, but I don't care. It's my teddy bear. I don't know if all of you are into bear awareness, <laughs> which kind of bear awareness, but we haven't talked about teddy bears. Normally Ajahn Brown has his teddy bear too, but normally in my groups, at least one person has one. So yeah, this is the first ordained bikuni bear in England, and her name is Venerable Piti Sukha, which means bliss. 
Venerable Piti Sukha, bliss and happiness. So there she is. Hi. And it sounds a bit silly, but bear awareness is an important part of the path. Oh, look, so respectful. <laughs> because sometimes you just need a bit of TLC. So you can sit with a little teddy bear and give it a hug. It sounds kind of, I mean, when I first heard these things, I thought, come on, I never even used to have teddy bears as a child. I really wasn't into that sort of stuff. But actually it works, especially when you don't have a companion to give you a hug in times of lockdown. I actually cried on one of my teddy bears during my mains retreat one day. It was just one day that I felt sad and uh, it got a wet head. But this one hasn't got a wet head. That's just that my mom crocheted a beanie because she thought it was winter time. So to keep Venerable P.T. Sukha warm. So yes, this is a, a reminder of bare awareness rather than B-A-R-E, which is that sort of awareness that's not got so much kindness infused. So bare awareness has the loving kindness included in it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let's finish for the day. I'm sure that most of you are also probably a little bit sleepy and ready for some quiet time. So we'll see you tomorrow morning and tomorrow will be our last very full day. So enjoy your rest. Good night. <laughs>